Hello folks, today we're going to look at the top five games that the narcissist wants to play with you to control your mind and manipulate your emotions. The first way of doing this is by pretending not to understand. So if you spend any time on uh, narcissistic abuse forums or online, you'll see there's a tremendous amount of attention given to the question, is this narcissism or is this autism? And I think a lot of this is because many people with NPD and in the cluster B spectrum rely on a sort of fake stupidity as a tactic for getting themselves out of trouble. They simply pretend not to understand basic morality, basic cultural mores, basic societal norms, so that they can shrug their shoulders and say, yes, you did catch me doing the terrible thing, but I didn't even know that that was wrong. It's usually pretty easily disproved if you're in a romantic relationship with somebody, you're having an argument with them over something they did that was morally wrong. They claim not to know that that was morally wrong. You only have to imagine how would that person respond if you two were together watching a TV show and that scene played out and they correctly sided with the good character and correctly condemned the behavior of the bad character. That would prove that they do indeed understand perfectly well what is right and wrong and what is considered normal and acceptable. The second favorite game the narcissist loves to play, deflect and attack. Attacking the attacker, attacking the person who's caught them out, who's brought something that they've done to their attention, perhaps even have, has evidence of a wrongdoing. This is a good way for the narcissist to put the focus back on the person who's brought that evidence to them. It's to deflect it and to attack the attacker, the person who is attacking them. This tactic is also known as whataboutism. Uh, this was a tactic that was developed, it's largely thought in Soviet Russia, where any criticism of the Soviet regime would be met with the response, but what did you do? What did you do? What have you done out in the world? You're not so perfect. And there's a finger pointing back the other way. In this way, it doesn't really matter what they do or what you've caught them doing. They can either always bring up something else that you've done that isn't that bad or and they can pretend it's really bad by using number one, pretending not to understand, or they can simply make it up. And in your indignation at being accused of something that you didn't do, you might have an explosive response and then the argument and the conversation gets focused on your explosive response rather than what they did. This is commonly referred to as reactive abuse. So the explosive reaction is induced in you so that they can turn around and say, look at you, look how angry you are, look how upset you've become, look at the fact you're screaming, tantruming, crying, in your anger and your frustration, you're the crazy one. Favorite game number three that narcissists absolutely love to use is to simply deny and then throw in a nice little distraction there to really throw you off their scent. So they will simply deny, deny, deny whatever you bring to them, whatever you say that they've done, whatever you accuse them of, they'll say that didn't happen. If it did happen, um, I didn't mean it. You know, I didn't say that. Well, we have you on tape saying it. Okay, well, if I did say it, um, you've heard me wrong. No, we didn't hear you wrong. It's there on the tape. Okay, well, if I did say it, and you didn't hear me wrong, that's not what I meant. And the denial will just go multiple logical levels deep until you're driven into complete exasperation. And again, it becomes a kind of reactive abuse because the person who's doing the accusation is looking to find some semblance of truth, is looking to try and reestablish balance and find some justice, and they won't because they're being denied that moment. Also thrown into that will be a distraction. So as I'm denying whatever it is, that uh, you're accusing me of doing, I'm gonna distract you. I'm gonna make you look at something over there. I'm gonna make this situation about something else or someone else. Another good way for me to distract you would be to use a pre-existing trigger that I know you have, a particularly sensitive subject or issue that I know you have and raise that. And then we can start arguing, conversing, focusing on that and not what the original problem was in the first place. The fourth game that the narcissist absolutely loves to play, we can call psychic reading. They'll tell you what it is you do and don't know. They'll tell you what it is you do and don't feel. They'll tell you what you did and didn't do in a place and a time that 
They weren't. They were not there. They couldn't possibly know that. This is a kind of way of binding you in to their reality and to their view of reality. It becomes very hard for you then to argue your way forward to some sort of reasonable adult to adult conclusion in that scenario because they've shut you down by saying you don't even believe that you're asking me something you don't even believe to be true. I know what you feel. This is what you feel. Again, back to the reactive abuse issue for people who are raised in an environment where um, that kind of thing was going on an awful lot psychic reading being told what you think being told what you feel not being asked being told could potentially take you back to a place in childhood or another period of your life where you were facing similar kinds of narcissistic abuse and could lead you into either breaking down crying and explosive rage something like that and then we're back to talking about what a crazy person you are and not talking about what the narcissist has actually done or said which is objectively immoral and wrong. The fifth game the narcissist loves to play is reframing. If the narcissist gets cornered, if the narcissist gets stuck, you have the evidence against them, you know absolutely what they said, what they did, and you know it was absolutely wrong, they can simply reframe the situation altogether and say, well, you know, this isn't even really about that. Yeah, you have this evidence against me, but come on, let's be honest here. This isn't about that. This is all really about your mother. This is all really about your ex-husband. This is all really about your kids and how you're failing them. Some other thing, if they can bring up some other thing and reframe the situation to be about that, it particularly makes sense if they know that that thing is sensitive and hurtful and could potentially trigger a very strong emotional response in the same way that psychic reading could binding people in with pretending to understand what they know and what they feel when you couldn't possibly and telling them when they try to complain when they try to object no 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 you don't even really feel that way what this is really about is this other thing over here that we've discussed before that you have a peculiar particular sensitivity or insecurity about to induce as much emotional anguish and emotional distress as possible now with all of these games what do we notice in the recipient when we're talking about the emotional reactions? Typically, there'll be an awful lot of anguish and also a lot of exasperation because you never feel like you're getting anywhere. And this is something that I just want to remind people of at this point. So much of what the narcissist is really about is not them. We tend to talk about narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder as though everything is about the narcissist. Sam Vaknin pointed this out, and I think he's 100% right. This is false. This is a misunderstanding. The narcissistic, the abusive relationship, whilst it seems to be all about them because they're so egocentric and they bring everything back to themselves, this dynamic, the games that they're playing with you, it's all about you and your emotional responses. Your emotional responses are key. So in this next section, let's look at some of the ways we can deal with these games that the narcissist likes to play. So in order to look at the, some solutions, some ways of dealing with this, let's consider our own reframe. You're not dealing with an adult human being. They are not speaking and acting in good faith. And the point is there is no point. The point of all their communication is only to garner an emotional reaction from you. There's a little aphorism that I came up with a few years ago. I'm very proud of it. And I think it's useful in this context. It runs as follows. You should abandon sincere communication when you are communicating with the terminally insincere. There's no moral imperative on you anymore to try and speak sincerely, to tell the truth, to be honest, to just get to the raw facts with this person when it's clear that they're not interested in that at all, they're only interested in inducing emotional reactions in you to create anguish and exasperation so that you submit, so that you give up. That's the point. There is no point but the emotional reaction. Abandon sincere communication when communicating with the insincere. Another reframe for you. Again, I'm proud of it. This is because I'm a bit of a sci-fi nerd. A good way of imagining the narcissistic personality disordered person 
is as a cloud of nanobots. And in this sci-fi horror movie, this cloud of nanobots can formulate into any shape or image or entity that they want to induce a certain emotional response in the target. The emotional response in the target that they're going for in the sci-fi horror movie would be horror, would be terror, would be fear. In this scenario, sometimes horror and terror is used, but predominantly it's anguish. It's an inescapable stress. You're just full of anguish all the time. And if you go into full-blown horror or fear, you might go into shock and you might leave. That's why I don't think they cook you at too high a heat. They tend to cook us at a much lower heat than that so that you just go into anguish and then become exasperated and become exhausted and then they can colonize you once you've given it. You're much easier to be rendered into a zombie, to be enslaved at that point. So think of that. Think of this horrifying sci-fi image. It's just a cloud of nanobots. It's going to say, do or appear as whatever it needs to say, do or appear as in order to induce this, 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 this is what it's all about, your emotional reaction. So that being said, if the five games I just showed you and any strategy a narcissist uses is about your emotional reaction, what does it behoove us to do? It behooves us to reduce our emotional reactivity. Now, there are different ways of doing this and I'm not a priest and I don't wanna invade your personal life and tell you how to live. Let me give you some pointers that I've used myself because I've been in narcissistic abusive relationships and I've used with clients over the last 10 years. Number one is give up hope. You will be doing yourself a huge favor and also grieve, also begin the grieving process. Give up hope that this person, you're say, let's say you're co-parenting or counter-parenting with a narcissist and you're hoping that one day they're gonna show up as a good mom or a good dad because you want your children to have a good mother or a good father to counterbalance your role. Give up hope. Begin grieving. That's never going to happen. Your hope is going to keep you in emotional reactivity and it's going to stop you from seeing the raw reality of the situation, which is that is not a human being, a human adult entity in the normal sense. That is a deeply damaged, deeply uh, um, dis uh, disturbed individual who now is only showing up to garner emotional reactions from people. Internalize it, know it, live it, breathe it, accept it, grieve, give up the hope, and you're in a much stronger position. On your way to doing that, wind down your emotional reactivity. Give them less oxygen, give them less air by using, everybody is familiar with this one, I'm sure, the gray rock technique. So give them less responses. If you can't cut off contact, and many times it's simply not practical to cut contact with people, reduce it as much as possible. If a text is sent and you must text back, use fewer words. If they're on the phone to you, spend less time on the phone. As you're speaking, say less words. Any and all information you give them can be used as ammunition against you at a later date and will be. So give them less. Stop telling them, here's another piece of advice that I have to tell clients all the time, Stop telling them how you feel. <laughs> you're not doing yourself any favors. You're just giving them more data to feed into the artificial intelligence system that runs the nanobots that is there to harvest your emotional reaction. Stop saying to them, you make me feel sad when you do this. You make me feel angry when you do this. Your therapist is telling you to do that if they don't understand narcissistic abuse. Because if you were in a... Um, normal family therapy, normal couples therapy, that would be the correct thing to do. Speak sincerely to your partner. Tell your mother how you feel. Maybe she doesn't understand. All she sees is your anger, but actually behind the anger, you're full of sadness or you're full of disappointment and she will come to an understanding with you and you can have a reconciliation. Reconciliation is death for a narcissist. Death, they, the last thing they want is reconciliation because that would cut this off completely. You'd be like, oh, well, you know, I've had my closure. I've had my reconciliation. Ah, <sighs> now I can go. They're not going to give you that. That would be like, hold, like taking somebody hostage with a gun to their head and then pulling all the bullets out of the gun and tossing the gun out the window. They're not going to reconcile with you. Stop telling them how you feel. This is terrible advice. Don't follow it. 
give them gray rock in your own personal space in your own personal space give up hope and grieve eventually you're going to have to come back to yourself so come back to you this is hard this is a little more complicated here's you you're a single celled amoeba sorry about that and uh, you have uh, boundaries and in this single celled amoeba good stuff stays in the nutrients and waste products go out the narcissist comes along and digs and digs and provokes and manipulates and provokes and gaslights and lies and reframes and your boundaries start to break good stuff flows out that shouldn't money time attention love crap stuff waste goes in that shouldn't resentment hatred sadism a lot of the narcissist enters your space through these gaps that they've created through trauma this is well physical trauma mirrors psychic trauma right if my arm breaks it's that's trauma this is psychic trauma so there's breaks there's breaks in the psychic wall they get in here and they fill you up with their resentment their hatred their impatience their sadism so you start to feel like them you start to look like them you start to become them that's the colonization process you have to start closing these walls off you have to start reclosing this and that's what giving up hope and grieving allows you to do and when i say come back to you that's what i mean you will feel like you must find a reconciliation through them and with them give up hope cry despair uh, who's the uh, philosopher danish philosopher kierkegaard the power of despair give up hope and then he would say give give up hope despair return to god he saw despair as being um uh, a useful emotion a useful state of mind because it showed it showed the human being that they'd fallen out of alignment with god this isn't a religious uh, video but say fallen out of alignment with right living fallen out of alignment with your own values fallen out of alignment with what you want in your own life fallen out of alignment with yourself in a certain sense that's self alienated from self inside of a narcissistic relationship you must give up on them you must give up on them and you must reclose these boundary walls last chapter let's talk about why it's so hard to give up on them and i'll offer you a solution in order to understand this concept better i highly recommend the videos of another youtuber professor sam vaknin okay and the particular videos you want to look for are about a process that sam calls co idealization it's part of his dual mothership concept of the narcissistic the abusive relationship he has a whole new completely new completely original model of narcissistic the abusive relationships that i'm going to say right now if you don't understand it you will never heal from the narcissistic the abusive relationship i'll explain to you why right now once you've gotten into a narcissistic the abusive relationship and your boundaries have been broken and so there's you are now receiving abuse your boundaries are being broken during this abusive process and the narcissist is taking from you what we call what is called narcissistic supply your emotional responses your adulation your fear your submission becomes their supply roughly speaking where this is not a nuanced description but that's okay it's good enough for us to understand during this process according to sam the narcissist will idealize you and put you on a pedestal you will idealize the narcissist and put them on a pedestal and then you will create a relationship in which you begin to fuse and merge it's called the dual mothership model because unconsciously you're being driven you're being pressured you're being press ganged into a relationship with the narcissist where they're saying i will give you a mother's love and worship and adulation to you as though you were my child it's boundaryless i will see only the good in you none of the bad and you over time will experience this idealization and get addicted to it in exchange you will mother them you will give them a mother's love doesn't matter the gender of the partners involved doesn't matter this is a co-idealization process this is the dual mothership model and so this is the relationship we enter into i said i was going to teach you why it's so hard to abandon them 
leave them uh, in every sense, not just physically, but also emotionally and spiritually and what we can do about this. The reason it's so hard to abandon them is twofold. If you break up with a narcissist, they've become your mother in a certain sense. So you will experience the pain and anguish of separating from them as a child separating from a parent. This is not, not, not an adult to adult relationship. All the therapy, all of the advice, everything that you take that, that encourages you, that would work in a normal scenario is backwards here. It's upside down, it's, it's reversed. This is not an adult and you are not an adult when you're with them. You can't be with them as an adult, doesn't work. They're not with you as an adult. You're in some strange land. You're in a weird space here that Sam Vatnin calls the shared fantasy. You've actually entered a kind of virtual reality simulator with them of the shared fantasy. There's no adult to adult here. There's only child to parent, which if you know your transactional analysis, it's pretty sick. So that means somebody has always got to be the savior in the scenario and somebody always has to be the victim in the scenario. And these relationships wobble between uh, a savior, a persecutor and victim. That's called the Karpman Triangle. We'll cover that on another day. Why is it so hard to leave? Number one, if you split up with them, you will experience that as though you were a child being left by mother. And even worse, you will experience the guilt. Haven't you felt that guilt? When I say to you, oh, just grieve them and give up. You go, yeah, I can do that. Something tenses up inside of you, that's guilt. Why? Because you must abandon them as a mother abandons a child. And you will feel tremendous guilt and tremendous resistance to doing that. I mustn't give up on them. I mustn't give up on them. I mustn't give up on them will be the refrain that runs through your head. When the very thing you should do to save your life is to grieve, despair, cry, scream, roll around on the floor, do whatever you need to do as part of your grieving process and walk away. This is why, because you've engaged in the co-idealization process of the uh, dual mothership and you're now in a weird alternate reality. It's not your reality. It's somebody else's reality. It's a virtual reality. When we enter the narcissist space, as mother and they enter our space as mother and we enter the, each other's spaces as a child, it's like getting into a matrix pod. It's like slipping inside of the matrix pod, taking a blue pill and then being fed through the narcissistic supply symbiotic relationship, a completely false reality. Don't you feel that way? Don't you already feel that? That you're living in some weird dream world like with different rules? You're doing things you would never do. You're saying things you would never say, but you're doing it whilst you're with them and you know it's bad, and you know it's ruining your life, but you cannot give up and leave. I'll tell you what the solution is to all of this and all that trouble, is you have to destroy the shared fantasy that you've created between the two of you and abandon that person as a mother abandoning a child and deal with those emotions. How do you destroy, a sh I didn't write this down before, shared fantasy, originally proposed by a psychoanalyst called Sander in 1989. Sam Vaknin has adopted it and adapted it for narcissistically abusive relationships. It is a sick shared fantasy space. Even if you leave them, even if you never see them again, if you don't destroy the shared fantasy, so where I showed you, you were two entities and you were conjoined, this space that conjoins you is the shared fantasy. If, if you never see them again, this continues. It lives on inside of you. You have to destroy this. If you don't, you'll just find another narcissist to fulfill the role again. I have a course for destroying the shared fantasy for good. It's called Unplug from the Matrix of Narcissistic Abuse. It's available on richardgrannon.com right now. You can do it with a therapist if you want to. If you have a therapist and you want them to contact us and get access to the course, we'll give it to them. You can also do the course on your own. It is not easy. It takes a lot of work. It takes about four months to complete. I think that's enough for today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. And I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. If you enjoyed that, please like and subscribe and get my free ebook here. Thank you. Okay, folks, the new course, uh, Unplug from the Matrix of Narcissistic Abuse, 
is out now. And if you're interested in finding out more about that, please click the link below.